Hello there, this is the old cat speaking, and this is the second episode of our first playthrough of Torment Tides of Numenera, with the power of random numbers. So, let's begin! So, after our initial meeting with these two characters, uh, we need to exit this room, but before we go, um, let's check it out for any useful things, loot and etc. A mechanical arm lies on the floor, presumably broken during your fall. Sparks pour from the arm's shattered housing, filling the air with a crazy stench. So, the power of random numbers tells us to try and pry something loose from it, and here's the tutorial for effort. If you select a companion's portrait in the effort window, they can assist the last cast off with some challenges. Your companion's stat pools are used instead of your own, and they may have different skills, abilities and statistics that make the challenge easier. Companions cannot assist in a crisis and can only use their stats during their turn. So, what we can do is we can assign any character right now using the power of random numbers, even if they're not suitable. Uh, let's see if we can get something out of this red lady. We could also randomize the points investment. So, here we can see that our chances of success are 100% and here it is. Taking care to avoid the sparks, you extract several handfuls of shiny trinkets and coin-like objects. You recognize their value at once. Such objects would be accepted as shins, the informal currency in most regions of the world. So you gather them up and take them with you. Okay, useful. So, as we can see in the inventory, it's some sort of a healing kit that heals 8 hit points. Broken fragments of the domed ceiling are scattered on the floor. They appear to be made of transparent synth. Sunlight falls through the ragged hole in the roof onto the shattered resonance chamber. It is hard to believe that you did this, that you plummeted through the curve of the pale blue sky, crashed through the dome and broke this delicate machine with your own body. It is hard to believe that you are still alive. Four mechanical arms hang over the center of the device, above the cracked, semi-transparent crystal of the sarcophagus. The fifth arm lies broken on the floor among the scattered synth and crystal shards, and the metal ring surrounds the array, dented and broken. 
by your impact crater. Jagged fragments of crystal are intermingled with synth from the shattered dome above. The crystal shards glitter in the light like captive suns. Perception. A faint scratching sound draws your attention to two crystalline chunks near your feet. As you watch, they tumble gently into each other and melt. Their disparate angles flow in together like water. After a moment, they, they part again, trailing shining threads of living crystal. It seems that the resonance chamber can heal from certain wounds, but not from the amount of damage you've done to it. At the rim of the crater, you find a sliver of crystal, sharp as a dagger, on one end and smooth on the other. It might make a usable, if somewhat crude, weapon. The padded interior beneath the coffin's cracked lid looks like it was made for a human body. Despite the damage, you don't see any way to open it and get inside. You glance between the sarcophagus and the needle-like protrusions at the end of the arms above. It seems likely that using this chamber would not be a pleasant experience. Thought through the remaining pieces of crystal, but they are too small or too unwieldy to be of any use. You feel the slightest hint of resistance every time you cross the ring, and now that you're paying attention, you know that your breath is echoing in your ears as though you were inside a glass dome. When you step outside the ring, the feeling passes. It may be your imagination, but some of the cracks in the crystal seem shallower than they were before. The ring seems to project some kind of field, like a protective dome, around the sarcophagus. Cables run from machines along the dome's walls to the base of the suspended arms, each of which is capped with long needles aimed at the cracked, coffin-like chamber at the center of the platform. Gem-like lights flicker dimly at the bases of the arms. Okay, so now let's go and check something else. Found some money and other useful items. Shins are usually metal, but can be made of glass, plastic or substances that have no name. Some are jagged bits of interesting material or small coin-like objects, such as highly decorative buttons from a machine, while others are properly minted and stamped with writing and images. This pliable synth container is tightly sealed, holding a swirling purple gas. The purple substances is harvested from a vast structure buried beneath the sands of the beyond, which seems to constantly replenish, though it is hard to gather. If the container is jammed hard against the surface, it becomes permeable, unleashing the gas within. The original purpose of the gas is not known, but when inhaled by a human being, it provides a rush of mental energy. Fleetfoot moss. This moss-covered pebble looks almost ordinary, and if it were lying on the ground it would be difficult to spot, but the moss shifts in unexpected ways, and the pebble vibrates as it does. If held against the skin, the moss latches on and is absorbed, providing powerful resuscitating energies. These pebbles are found by diving into the waters around Sagas Cliffs, perhaps grown by an unknown interaction with the surrounding Numenera. So, let's take all of those useful items and move on to another marker. A slate black, unimpressive device hunkers before you. As you reach out to touch it, the triangle of lights on its casing blazons into life and an image unfolds in your mind. A towering crystal arch rises over a jagged grey landscape. The air is dead and stifling, and there, at its emerald peak, the image collapses, leaving you staring into the device's triangular array of lights. Command me, the device, or the intelligence within it says, each word carefully etched with distaste. 
Your command was not understood, the intelligence says with clear satisfaction, sounding for all the world like it understood the question but is choosing not to answer. Command me. Your command was not understood, the intelligence chuckles, its lights pulsing. Command me. The three lights throb irritably. Heated air sighs from the device's vents, and then a towering list of commands races through your mind, far too fast to read. You rub your eyes, groaning, and the intelligence chortles. Command me, it says smugly. So, this device is a kind of a dick, so let's kick its ass. An indignant hum rises from the intelligence's engines as you examine its ancient casing. So, the ass-kicking begins. Let's choose the character and the amount of points assigned to the effort. You fully depleted one of your stat pools, might, speed or intellect. To recover your stat pools you can find a place to sleep or use consumable items and ciphers. Success! The intelligence's lights flutter in alarm just before your foot smashes into the base of the device. Something within goes crunch. Cell gating damaged. It gasps. The trio of lights focusing on you with blinding intensity. All prisoners lost. Shattering Lugumvo. A hatch springs open near the dent left by your foot, and the lights flicker off as you claim a hissing component from the device's smoking interior. View shard. The shard of glass displays an image of three strangely carved children in a field. A sequence of them playing a simple ball game repeats itself. After repeated viewings, you notice a small child standing further away in the field. The fourth child is looking directly at you, her large eyes brim with fear. You planning on breaking every machine in here? Tiny glowing modes float through the interior of this tower. Each one is surrounded by much smaller modes, like thousands of worlds circling their suns. The flexible tubes that are attached to this machine appear to be later additions. Someone cobbled the device together, but its function is unclear. So, looks like we've explored this chamber and we've stayed here long enough, so let's move on to the next area. On it. The gold tide represents charity, sacrifice and empathy. It is the tide of people whose primary goal is to help others, especially at the cost to themselves. The water is clear, almost unnaturally so, revealing ruins upon ruins as far as you can see. By the way, Aligurin wants to speak to us with press triangle to do this so. This is the reef of fallen worlds, kid. It's a dangerous place at the best of times. And with you lighting up the sky as you fell, well, we should get out of here as soon as possible. Why were you looking at me when you said that? I wasn't, he growls. Don't be so paranoid. But when she isn't looking, he raises his eyebrows at you knowingly. The Numenera of the past are always dangerous, but there are other dangers too, some closer than others. Scan thoughts. I hate to think what Calestige might do to him if I weren't here.
You want to fix that crystal chamber back there, yeah? First step is getting out of this reef. You want me to tell you? He laughs without mirth. The Numenera are all around you, everything left over from the prior worlds. Sagas Cliffs thrives by trading artifacts from ancient civilizations. Hells, you can scoop a handful of earth without finding trade from prior worlds mixed with it. Numenera is anything from the prior worlds, but mostly we mean the stuff of value to us. A lot of the Numenera are just oddities, fancy trinkets with little real use, but sometimes you'll get a cipher that lets you do something incredible. Artifacts are worth even more. A cipher will only do something once, but artifacts last a lot longer. Though they can burn out at the most inconvenient times. He frowns. Not that it ever happened to me. Of course we've got no idea what most of this junk was originally intended for. In most cases it doesn't really matter. Like, you might find what used to be a propulsion unit for a star chariot, but who the hell knows enough to build you the rest of it? Better to use it as a weapon or a power source. He scowls, frustrated about something. I bet we could remake the world if we knew a tenth of the secrets of the ancients, but most days it's a challenge just to survive. And now I've got uh, the random number that made me finish this conversation. Maybe prematurely, but let's go along with it. All right. Some shiny new loot here. Let's see what it does. Illutrated force. The crystal pulses with vibrant energy, softly expanding and contracting as if breathing in and out. A needle protrudes from the crystal center. If inserted into a vein, the crystal's pulsing energy can be absorbed to increase the user's physical stamina and muscle mass for a short time. These crystals are purified from a murky liquid found rarely in the Caravia Sound. Their origin is unknown and the process to harvest them without destroying the active substance yes. is difficult, but the supply appears plentiful. Two floating cones whirl and spin deliriously around each other, giggling like children being tickled. The air around them smells of sweet burning leaves. And we get a number that allows us to use our ability, so let's do it. Success, you managed to graze one of them with the tip of your finger. Rorn, a uh, voice says, and your vision is stolen from you. A moon hangs over you, but it's not the one you recognize. It's black and in a pearl-white sky. Thick, flat asteroids orbit it like petals in the wind. You feel questing tendrils at your ankle, and the hot wind on your face smells of scorched hair and grief. Your vision returns. The cones hang motionless for only a second before resuming their giggling dance. The longer you stare at this artifact, the more you're convinced that they turn faster when their spiraling paths cross each other. Okay, so now we leave them alone and let's try to find something else. A tangled cluster of metallic tendrils grows from the depths of the nearby water. Strangely, they resemble clawed alien hands, most of which have seven or eight fingers. So let's try and hulk something out of this mess. Success! You grip the hand nearest to you and snap it from its roots. Stepping back, you give it a couple experimental swings. Good balance, it might make a decent weapon. This metallic object resembles a clenched eight-fingered hand attached to a forearm. 
You snapped it off a metallic tendril in the Reef of Fallen Worlds. It has a decent heft and balance, and its steely material is powerful enough to deal significant damage, but it's only a makeshift weapon and is somewhat clumsy to use. You aren't happy unless you're breaking things, are you? Perception. You try to lean around the nearest palm and notice that it innocently moves with you, as if guided by a wind that's not there. You faint right and go left instead, just in time to see what the hand was trying to hide. One of the lower hands is passing a small silvery object, a seed pod, to another. Here we have an option to try and snatch the object from the hands, but random numbers say we should leave the cluster alone. A matte black obelisk floats in mid-air above the water. It has sharp curved sides that converge to a glowing tip that brightens or dims with the passing of the bay's faint breezes. You raise your hand toward the obelisk. Dull green light wells from within the black stone, fixed on you like a furious eye. I knew someone who did what you're about to do, the girl says casually. Aeon Priest, a beam came out the top of the thing and ripped his face off. Made a fancy night light out of his crystal necklace, though. But hey, I'm sure you know what you're doing. Oh, hush. At least that poor priest died in service of his curiosity, rather than stumbling about the coast complaining and feeling sorry for himself. Go ahead if you must, she tells you, ignoring Alligaren's glare. But do be careful. Well, yeah. Better leave it alone and random numbers say so. I'm ready. A bubbling mass of sludge floats on the surface of the water. Every once in a while an oily nodule separates from it and hurtles into the sky. You catch momentary glimpses of a muck-coated object in the putrid mass. Carefully, you lean closer to the heaving mass. After a moment's study, you notice that the globules rising into the sky always contain something, be it a shining core or untainted seawater or a tiny fish. Perception. Far below the water, you spot a vast dark reservoir of the sludge. And again, random numbers tell us to leave it alone. This device is collecting black goop from somewhere underwater and pumping it to the nearby spout. On it. This metal door is thick, heavy and unmarked by time. Double rows of circular bumps run horizontally and vertically across its surface. It is firmly sealed. Got some loot up there, always good to explore every nook. We just take it all, we know what these items are already. Yawning intake marks the front of a long dead construct. Inside, the metal is pitted black and ancient. Although this cube hovers in the air, you can feel the ground shudder with its vibrations. The strange lines and rippling forms of the sunken buildings are dramatically different from the architecture above the waterline.
As you step onto what looks like the back of the enormous construct, four strangers approach you. In the lead is a wiry man with parallel scars running from cheek to collarbone on the left side of his face. He gives you a welcoming smile, pulling on grey gloves embedded with pulsing lights. He's about to say something to you when he notices Calistige. Scan thoughts. He's the star, or he came out of it. But what does Cal have to do with this? Cal, I thought you'd sworn off trolling the reef. Found anything tasty? His eyes travel up and down both you and Alligarn. Odds and ends, Quarrel. Nothing that would interest you, I'm sure. Her words are calm, but she has gone quite still. Scan thoughts. What is he doing here? He has something up his sleeve, I know it. Right to the point, this one, isn't he? I know most of the draft that scavenges the reef these days, but it's a rare pleasure to see a new face. He smiles as disarming. All I want is information. A fallen star landed near here not long ago. I don't suppose you were around to see it. I don't trust them. Eligern hisses in your ear, but loud enough that Candestish can hear too. Any friend of hers is a cheat, a killer, a both. What does that say about you, dear? She gives Eligar a venomous smile. Killer or not, she whispers, Goro is not a man who can be trusted with unvarnished truth. Tread lightly. Ah, threats. Thank you so much. I've prepared a wonderful trap and would have hated to see it go to waste. Quora clenches his gloved fist and signals his companions. Red Tide raises a moderate amount, Silver Tide raises a moderate amount. So, random numbers just make us attack these guys instantly without trying to talk to them. Well, let's go and initiate the crisis. What a shame, Quora says and glances at his companions. Now! In a crisis, characters take their turns in the sequence shown at the top of the screen. That sequence is determined by each character's initiative. You can improve the score by training the initiative skill. Not all encounters must be solved with muscle alone. Try using the Numenera artifact nearby or talking directly to Quarrel. How you choose to solve the crisis is up to you, but there will be consequences to your actions. I didn't expect the crisis to start so suddenly and uh, should have checked my inventory beforehand in order to distribute weapons between my companions, but I'll have to live with it for now and win this thing. Allegrin's body is covered in strange shifting tattoos. He can use the living tattoo's ability to pluck a strand of ink from himself, granting him the living tattoo's fatal. While the fatal is active, he gains increasing bonuses by chaining together similar actions, attacks, healing, applying other fatals. If he uses a different kind of action, he breaks the chain and loses the fatal. This ability does not use his move or his action, so he can activate it and then do something else. I tried to use this ability of Adagurns uh, during the combat, but uh, not much success with it. I should pay a close attention to this one later, but uh, spoiler alert, uh, we part both of them after this crisis.
here I desperately try to figure out how to re-equip weapons and maybe give something to my companions, but to no avail, I should have done that before. Calistige is a dimensional husk who exists in multiple realities at the same time. She can use this transdimensional power to teleport between locations using her dimensional superposition ability. Teleporting uses her move instead of her action, so she can activate it and then do something else. Energy pulses occasionally over this dish, a flash of melancholy prickles your mind with each wave. There is a shallow depression in the surface here, like many others scattered around the construct. Unlike the others, energy still pulses across this one at random intervals. A slight yet implacable sense of unease emanates with each wave of energy. There is a loose lens at the center of the depression. You think you could redirect the psychic effects somewhere more useful but it will be tricky to get to it in between the energy pulses. Um, here we don't have any more action points for this character, so we'll have to try some other time.
Taste your death! So, as you can see, this clumsy battle continues, but looks like I'm winning this thing. This is a finely made armband, or perhaps a bracelet for something larger than most humans. It is made of ordinary golden metal and encrusted with worthless gems. If you focus your gaze on it for a few seconds, it disappears from sight and can no longer be felt against the skin. It reappears at its last location once no one is looking there. Large, heavy and sharp, this enormous blade is truly deadly. It requires two hands to use.
lost. Okay, so now it's Aligurn's turn, and let's try to use this device against our attackers. Success! With careful timing, it's easy to twist the lens into the what is hopefully a more favorable position. The lens glows, warning of an impending energy pulse. The field of energy extends outward and warms into eyes, ears and mouths of Quora's team. Hope drains from their faces, replaced by a numb stare. Then the shallow depression becomes dark and dormant. We must get to Quoro's corpse. The device implanted in his arm that he used to deactivate the light breaches is ungoverned. Without his input, the breach relays are fast becoming overburdened. You know an awful lot about how this works. Is this a new trick of yours? She shoots him a deadly glare. Shut up and help disarm it before this entire construct explodes. The strong glass panel embedded in Quora's forearm is stained in blood. Beneath it, lights and indicators flicker in time with the spasms of energy at the deactivated bridge ends. Okay, so disarm this I need action points which I don't already have, so it's next turn then. And we need to deal with this last guy, and he's trying to run away now, but... The bastard is so dead. During a crisis, events sometimes occur that can change your objective. Killing Quoro has caused the bridge controls to overload, and they will explode if you don't disable them quickly. To get out of this crisis unscathed, you will need to interact with Quoro's corpse to reactivate the light bridges. I know that, I just need action points. Duh.
Now I finally get the option to activate the effort and try to destroy the device. Success. You carefully examine the exterior of the panel. After a few moments of study, you discover that an odd-looking protrusion is actually a latch. You move it and the strong glass panel snaps open. Inside the device you see a gently flashing button. When you press it, the light generators hum back to life. So the device is disabled and now let's catch that escaping guy. Yet let's use the beam on our right. A long tube emerges from the plating of the dead construct and winds upwards. The duct terminates in a hollow cone. Every few seconds a minute drop of green liquid drips out of the end and steams as it strikes the ground. The fluid is some kind of highly corrosive acid. It would do severe damage to organic tissue. A round dial rests at the base of the cone, ringed by a thin crust of corroded metal. It appears to be a valve that controls the flow of the noxious substance, but it looks like it hasn't been moved in centuries. So, let's get physical with it. Success! With a crack, the valve bulges a centimeter. A thin stream of noxious fluid pours from the nozzle and hisses into the metal surface. You open the valve a bit further and aim the ensuing spray. collapse into a single reality. Okay, the crisis is won, but someone has serious explaining to do. That was a fiasco. I hope you've learned something, kid. You can't trust her in any reality. Scan thoughts. I knew I couldn't trust Calisthenia. This is the last time I make that mistake. Excuse me? Are you suggesting I had something to do with Quoro's plans? Oh, I cannot abide with the rabbit paranoia a moment longer. Are you suggesting you didn't? An old friend of yours just happens to be waiting for us, armed and outnumbering us as we return from the greatest find the Reef has seen in years. It's too convenient for me, too convenient, by far. They attacked me too, in case you missed that. Well, they didn't kill you, maybe you intended for them to weaken us so you could stab us in our sleep tonight. He throws up a hand for stolen Calisthesia's retort. Look, I don't care. Fact is, I can't trust you anymore, and I wonder why I ever did. This is the last we travel together. I've got enough to worry about without having to watch my back 28 hours a day. He turns to you. You come in, kid, or what? Uh, this is just the last needle that crushed the Anine. You haven't seen one tenth of her depth, not one twentieth. She's a backstabbing bitch and this mess here only proves it. Always a paragon of class, Allegorn. If I did have any interest in betraying you, do you really think I would need Quarrel's help? Yet this is the thanks I get for coddling your pain-rattled judgmental weakness for so long. I've had enough. She turns to you. Child, I am happy to guide you, but I will not walk another step with this paranoid buffoon. Finally, something we agree on, he growls. Kid, she'll chop off your head and spit down your throat. I'll get you where you need to go and let you sleep at night to boot. It's up to you. You know what? 
By the power of random numbers, I decided that I don't need you both. Makes sense. He shoots a look uh, fraught with meaning at Calistige. If you change your mind, you can find me in the underbelly. I travel around, but I'll keep an ear to the ground for you. At least he's not staying with her. On the other hand, if you'd prefer civilized company, you can find me at the Order of Truth. I will be happy to aid your quest, but do not come with Alligarn in tow. I will not suffer him again. The feeling is extremely mutual. Farewell, child. Come find me. Now that you've dealt with Quoro and his goons, you can continue on to the city of Saga's Cliffs. To reach the city, cross the bridge at the north end of the platform. Before you go, you may wish to take a moment to recover and search the bodies of your defeated enemies for any equipment or valuables. And that's what we'll do right now. Knave's card. A playing card shows a grinning Nipovian child. When you rub your thumb over the card, it triggers an adaptive illusion that changes the face of the card, though you can't discover the trick to getting specific card faces to appear. Dominant Tide. None. Whenever you activate the card, it fits between different card faces, usually setting back to the Nibovian child, though its smile is gone, replaced by a puzzled frown. We also found a crossbow. This is a basic crossbow, a bow assembly mounted horizontally on a wooden stock. It's lower than an ordinary bow, but has great accuracy. Well, that's probably good. Let's check our inventory and uh, assign weaponry. Bounder. Teleport to a position within range. Consumes movement. Heavy and solid, this brown orb feels like a rock that has been worn smooth by a constant flow of water. On one side, there's an indentation that just fits a human hand. When activated, the boulder absorbs the user and teleports them to a nearby location within line of sight. Image blocker, cipher. Immediately gain hidden with no chance of being spotted. Consumes action. This shape stone object has a small featureless button on it. When pressed, the device sends out psychic interference, blocking visual perception of the holder. Subjects affected by the interference will notice blurred and distorted squares over the user's body and will be unable to see the user at all unless looking directly at the target. And there's also a dagger, a well-used, carefully honed dagger. One of the simplest weapons available, but in the right hands also one of the most lethally quick. You found a cipher. Ciphers are Numenera objects that can trigger a powerful effect, but can only be used once. Ciphers and your cipher limit score are displayed in a special section of the inventory screen. Take care not to accumulate more ciphers than your cipher limit, or you will experience unpleasant side effects. Cobalt petals fold over a short metal stem. Calcified minerals holds the ancient weapons closed. A spherical head hangs loosely from the st stanchion. A single metal fiber holds it in place. A sickly green crust scaps over numerous cracks and divots in this turret. So let's loot the last guy. Thick air snare. Akin to how a seashell held to one's ear can bring forth the sounds of the sea, merely holding this teal bulb shaped flute device causes one's loose clothing and hair to flow about them as if affected by ocean currents. Upon blowing into the instrument, a violent pulse ripples forth as a swarm of nanites thicken the local atmosphere to water like consistency. Shaped by the wilderness wheel, only those seen as enemies find themselves slowed or otherwise hindered by the viscous air. Lore, mystical novice. Common opinion among Aeon priests is that these devices were scavenged from the same ruined city of aquatic mutants. A renegade nano has claimed proof of an alternate theory, claiming a rare species of translucent amphibious birds known to hunt off the shore of coastal towns produce these instruments, which are in truth the fertilized eggs of the elusive creatures. 
Their migratory patterns are too complex to decipher and thus they are doubly rare due to both the difficulty of reliably finding their nests and their diminishing numbers, for they have been hunted to near extinction. And here's the buzzer. The small mechanical device fits comfortably in a human hand. It fires thumbnail-sized razor-sharp discs. While these devices are sometimes made from scavenged Numenera, skilled artisans can craft them from raw parts. They are fairly common weapons, though still valued and dangerous. Okay, now we need to do that we should have done long time ago. To go to the inventory and assign some items and check other stuff. Nothing new in the journal, so we've done everything we could here, and it's time to move to the next area. And this concludes our second episode of the current season. I don't know uh, wh where our adventure takes us, but I hope it will be something good. I uh, started to understand this game a little better, and, well, I have some hopes. So, until next time.